be more boisterous when we get those opportunities. I always remember the old lady that lived down from us. Our children were about half afraid of her. She was older and just kind of wore dilapidated clothes. And for some reason, I just seemed a little bit timid towards her. I always thought to myself, tell her you should stop someday and just ask her to go to church with you. But in my mind, I had already made the decision. I was like, she'd give me some excuse. She'd have me either way or another. She'd say no. And then one day I passed that house and there was no more activity down there. She had passed. I'm good with that. So my encouragement to you this morning is let's not be silent. We can wear our sneakers, but it's time that we, the church, make some noise. I love this song because it says, Happy day, oh happy day, you washed away my sin. I'll never be the same again. If that's you this morning, stand up. Let's make some noise. <laughs> Stay in his story. Death is beaten, you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave. Life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive.
You've heard me say this probably every time I come up front, and I mean it from the depth of my heart. What a joy it is to be gathered in worship today. First time visitors, of course, we have a visitor's card, corner of the pew, online. We'd encourage you to drop us a note that you're worshiping with us. The treehouse tree is off to a great start, our children's ministry. In fact, our meeting right now, they're doing their time of worship and a time of class, but we need help. We need men and women that can come alongside and help us. So we encourage you, if you can help with our treehouse ministry, we encourage you to be a part of that. Trunk or treat is the 21st. It's coming quick. That is this Saturday, correct? We need some more help. Here's what we need. We need adults and students to head up the pumpkin painting. We have over 100 pumpkins that need painted. In my day, we ate them. Nowadays, they paint them. So we need help. So if you could help us with that. Also, we need some cookies. If you would put two cookies per, in a bag, a, a Ziploc bag for the children, that'd be great. Uh, of course, there's candy that's in the back of our sanctuary. If you're using your vehicle and your trunk, we need, need you here by 445 on Saturday. Again, it's a ministry to our community. To let our community know not only do we love them, that, but God loves them. So I encourage you to be a part of that. The nominating committee, the report of the nominating committee, is on the bulletin board, it's posted. The nominating, the um, um, congregational meeting is November the 12th. November the 12th, so we encourage you, friends and family, to be here. Little Josiah was born yesterday. Bruce and Julie, now our grandparents again. Jess and Brandy are doing well, and little Josiah is doing well, so I encourage you to keep this family in our prayers. At this time, Bucky has a presentation. As he's coming, would Pastor Scott and Sheena come forward? And Pastor Paul, would you come forward as Bucky comes forward? Pastor Paul is coming. Halime right now is traveling back from Houston, Texas. So we need to be praying for Halime as she travels Okay, this, here he comes. Here comes he Pastor comes. Paul. <laughs> um, this um, time of the year uh, when we uh, remember uh, and give uh, uh, special appreciation to our pastors um, in our church and, of course, in churches all across our land. Uh, we're so thankful that God has directed and led you folks here to be with us, uh, to minister to us. And we appreciate your love and your care and your ministry here at Watson Town Alliance Church and all that you do. And uh, we are so thankful and so blessed to have men and women who are ministering to us in this great way. Amen. And uh, I'd like to give uh, a, a gift to them as uh, appreciation for a uh, little bit of what they do here at Watson Town Alliance Church. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. Let's give a hand this morning. Congratulations. Now just be, before you sit down, uh, I'd like to just have a word of prayer with you. Our Father, we thank you for the way that you've guided and directed and led in the lives of those that minister here full time at Watson Town Alliance Church. We thank you so much for them, Lord. And Father, we pray that you will bless them and continue to use them in a great way in the days and weeks and months to come, Lord. We pray that you will provide for them, protect them, and help them as they work together to bring the Lord Jesus Christ and the importance of that in our lives and the lives of people in our area. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We had to put out a note to the congregation about pastor appreciation. If you forgot, it's not too late. So if you want to drop a note, a card to them, or put something in the offering plate, designate for pastor appreciation. You hear me say this a lot, God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. There's something God has miraculously done within our fellowship that I had put in an email note yesterday to the board members that we had an issue we were dealing with, we were praying over this issue, God delivered in a mighty way. So I put this in an email note, it took me forever to type it. I had the board members and the elders on this note. I sent it. 
I have no idea where it went. <laughs> so board members and elder board, listen up. I'm going to tell you the great news. A couple of months ago, we were notified by an insurance carrier that they were no longer going to insure the church because we had the issue with the, the flooding from the, the baptistry. We had several claims. They were dropping us. That's not good. Because once you're dropped, companies, uh, they're not likely to bring you back and it's at a huge price. So we put together a team, Natalie Longnucker and Dave Hunter. He knows a little bit about insurance. They were the team. And first, the proposals were pretty ugly. And some people flat out told us, not going to insure us. But in God's providence and goodness, you remember Nate Huffman, the Gideon that came and spoke to us? He was an insurance agent with Brotherhood Mutual. We now have coverage better than what we had before. We have better benefits than we had before and just a little increase in price. So to God be the glory, we had an issue. Is it good God cares us? He cares about every issue of us, whether it's a church or our individual lives, that as we seek the Lord and pray, he delivers. He delivered in a mighty way. I think we need to applaud that issue there this morning. Let's all stand together as we enter worship. From Psalm 95, verses 1 through 7. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and exalt him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Father, we are here today to worship you. Thank you for your providence and care upon us. Thank you that you love us. We are here today to worship you. Guide us through this time in Christ's name. Amen.
your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. Worship you, so I. Th 
Stay back at this mic. I know it might not look as aesthetically correct, but I'd rather breathe into this mic than dirty up the other one, so bear with me. Bow your heads. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, give thanksgiving. Let your requests known be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. Lord, we welcome you here this morning. Lord, we thank you for the provisions you've made for us. Lord, we thank you for your presence. And Lord, we just want to lift up the many ministries of this church. And I hope I don't leave any out, but Lord, we think of the Treehouse, these young people's ministry. We think of the A29 student ministries, the table, James, the upcoming trunk or treat, life learning, the pickleball outreaches, Iwana the Bible studies, and the small groups. Lord, would you continue to bless these ministries? Lord, we ask for growth, and we just ask for a closer relationship with you. Lord, I love our statement of this church. We are imperfect people connecting for growth in Christ. Help us to not just say those words, but to seek you first in all that we do. Lord, we think of those that are battling things, 
think of those that are battling sickness. We ask for healing. We think of those that are facing upcoming procedures, anticipate upcoming tests. Lord, we know how that can worry and it can play on our hearts and minds. Lord, would you meet them right where they're at? Lord, we think of those in times of war right now over in the Middle East. Lord, it just seems hard to understand, but it seems like everywhere we turn, there's turmoil. Lord, we know that you are in control. We especially this morning lift up Mandy Keyhole with the surgery, which will be tomorrow. We think of Judy Bergman and the loss of her mother, Martha. Lord, would you encourage those people that are going through these difficult times? Lord, this morning we also lift up Pastor Scott and Pastor Paul. Would you encourage them? Would you give them strength and en- strength and endurance? And Lord, as Pastor Scott comes to share what you've placed on his heart, Lord, would you right now prepare our hearts to not just hear the word, but to abide in it, to live it, to come closer to you in the service. May we be your hands and feet. Lord, we just give you this time together as we look into your word, Lord. We love you. And it's easy to just go through life and forget our times with you. So, Lord, we ask you to walk with us. We ask you to bless the ministries of this church from the top to the bottom. Be with the elders and all the decisions that are made. And we just give you this time in your precious name. Amen. have your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to open them with me to Matthew chapter 20. If you're uh, using a device, um, scroll down to Matthew chapter 20, I guess. Uh, As you're turning to Matthew 20, um, I just want to say a word of thanks. Uh, Thanks for the appreciation gift that we received, Uh, but also thank you for prayer for Sheena and myself last weekend as we were away. Uh, I was celebrating a class reunion. I'm not going to tell you which one it was, but... I was just going to say, before I'm so rudely uh, interpreted, uh, I'm a proud member of the class of 73. That's 1973, not 1873. And uh, it was a joy to uh, see all of my classmates. Um, It's amazing how fast time goes by. Uh, as we as we met together and we talked together, a couple things just really hit me. That number one, time does go fi- by quickly, but number two, um, when when your life is lived with Christ at the center of it, it makes all the difference. As I met some of my classmates and I talked with them, there was kind of a um, a discouragement. There was a sadness in some of their lives. And I realized as we talked that Christ wasn't at the center of their lives. And I'm not saying that there isn't sadness when we have Christ there, but it, I, it just came home afresh and anew to me, the goodness of God, Amen. the way God is with us through the years, his faithfulness, and uh, this morning we're going to talk about his grace, how his grace is sufficient for everything that we go through. So thank you so much for your prayers as we were away. It's good to be back. <coughs> we... Uh, are going to move into a series, Lord willing, over the next several weeks on the grace of God. And there's a reason behind this. I was actually going down two different paths other than this one. And uh, as I I went down those paths, I I received a check in my spirit. I knew that wasn't the way that I was supposed to go. And then I, I, uh, I turned to this idea of grace, and it, it, it just opens. If, you, if you're familiar at all with teaching or, or sermonizing, 
you realize there's a, a freedom that comes as you move in the direction of the Spirit, and, and this was certainly His direction for us. And I think there's a reason behind that. I believe that, uh, and you've heard me say this before, but I'm saying it even with more urgency. I believe we're moving into a time as a country, as a, the world, and certainly as a church, that we are going to need God's grace more than ever. We always need God's grace, but we are going to need God's grace more than ever. We are going to be put to the test in ways that we maybe can't even imagine. And so uh, as, I, as I moved in this direction, I felt the Holy Spirit just ministering to my heart. This is what I have for our people now. And so uh, the, over the next several weeks, we're going we're gonna to go deep, more deeply into this. It, when, you, when I mention the word grace, what comes to your mind? We use that term a lot in the church and even in, in everyday life. You, you hear about amazing grace, that beautiful hymn. Saved by grace, uh, saying grace before your meal. Uh, you hear about, oh, that person is so gracious. They're so gracious. You've heard me mention in the past EGRs, extra grace required people. Uh, and whenever I say that, you know, it's funny. Whenever I say that, I, I notice that spouses are, are elbowing each other. Now, I want you to know I can see that from up here. And we're live streamed, so people around, I, I mean, they can see it as well. Extra grace required individuals, those that challenge our patience, our ability to, to move through uh, just different things. And then the last thing, uh, you, you hear somebody say, well, you know what? When they move, they're, they are so graceful. Grace is used over and over. But here's the question. Do we really understand the power and the wonder of God's grace? It is central to everything else we do, but do we understand it really well? If you turn your, your outline over, question number one, I just put that question before you. If, you. if you were to give a definition to somebody that was not a believer, how would you define God's grace? What would you say to them? And so we want to move deeply, more deeply over the next several weeks into this. I want to give you a quote from J.I. Packer. J.I. Packer is a theologian from years past. He's written a classic, a sentinel classic called Knowing God, a powerful book. And in that, that book, under the heading of grace, he says it this way. Many church people pay lip service to the idea of grace, but there they stop. Their conception of grace is not so much debased as it is non-existent. The thought means nothing to them. It does not touch their experiences at all. Talk to them about the church, church's heating system or last year's budget, and they are right there with you at once. But speak to them about the realities to which the word grace points, and their attitude is one of differential blankness. They do not accuse you of talking nonsense. They do not doubt that your words have meaning, but they feel that whatever it is that you are talking about, it is beyond them. And the longer they have lived without it, the surer they are that at this stage in life, they don't really need it. And nothing could be further from the truth. Grace is central to everything that we are and all that we do in the, in the spiritual walk. It's the heart of everything that God calls us to. We want to look at Matthew chapter 20 this morning, and it's ironic in this sense. When Christ and Christ's teaching and his preaching, he never uses the word, the Greek word charis, which is grace. He never uses that word. But all through his teaching, grace is there. It's interwoven. And in this parable that we have before us this morning, he is explaining very, very clearly through a story, he's explaining the contrast between a merit mindset set, concept, which is to work and to earn and to deserve, and a grace economy. He, he makes a stark contrast. And something I want to mention right now about a parable. This is a parable. A parable has one main thought, one main lesson. It's not an allegory. An allegory would be like Pilgrim's Progress, where each element of the story has something to do with the spiritual walk. The par a parable usually has one main concept, and the main concept that Christ is getting across in this parable is grace versus merit. He's, he's drawing a contrast. If you have your Bibles open, I'm going to read, beginning at verse 1 in chapter 20 of, of Matthew for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. 
About the third hour he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour he went out and still found others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going to the first. The workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came and each received a denarius. So those who came, those who came, now, so when those who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered to one of them, Friend, am I not being unfair to you? Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Do I not have the right to do what I want with my own money? Are you envious because I am generous? So, verse 16, the last will be first and the first will be last. In this parable, as we look at it from a human perspective, if I were hired last, uh, last and I received the same as the person that had worked all day, I would probably feel the same way. I, I want to tell you a little story, a true story. In fact, I called my friend, uh, Billy, this morning, uh, who I've been friends with since I was three years old, and I wanted to be sure that I got the details of this story correct. When I was a student, when we were students at Tekoa, we uh, had a chapel every day. And at the end of chapel, uh, Greg John Brumbaugh, he's a big guy, stood outside and he said, who, who needs extra money? Now he was saying that to needy college students. And so we all lined up and he said, boy, do I have a job for you. He said, uh, we, last week we helped a farmer and he paid us for the task that he asked us to do $7 an hour. Now, if I'm going to translate that from that time to this, it would be like $20 an hour. So you can imagine, we were all, we were all ears. We were si signing us up. And he said, all you have to do, we did it last, last week, and, and you're going to do a very similar thing. It took us about an hour, a little bit more than an hour, and he, he gave each one of us $7. And so we traveled out to the farm, five of us. And when we arrived, we, we should have noticed some things, but as we arrived, we drove by a pavilion, an open pavilion, and in that pavilion was stacked sacks, 50, 50 uh, pound sacks of citrus pulp, stacked up high. We drove by that, and we drove, and there was a tractor trailer. The tractor trailer was 40 feet long. And when they op when opened the doors of that tractor trailer, it was stacked to the ceiling all the way with citrus pulp. But there was no open pavilion by that tractor trailer, the trailer. There was an old shed, two-story shed. And the farmer came to us and he said, I want you to unload the, track, the trailer into that shed, beginning in the top rooms first and working your way down and then uh, fill in the rooms down at the bottom. And we began to think about that a little bit. Now, this is Georgia, and it's, it's very warm. Let's put it that way. The shed was old, there was no air conditioning, and the, track, the trailer itself was metal sitting in the Georgian sun. Now, you, you kind of get the picture. And so we thought, well, you know, okay, all right, let's get at it. And so we began to unload that tractor, that, that trailer. And what we found was, as you loaded the 50-pound bags, as you walked into the narrow hallway and even narrower stairwell, you couldn't even hold it on your shoulders. You had to put it in front of you and walk up the steep stairs and walk back to the back rooms and begin to stack these, these uh, sacks on top of one another. And I, did I mention it was citrus pulp? <clears throat> now think about that. Citrus pulp in burlap sacks with the powder, that citrus powder coming out all over you. And within about half an hour, all of us, if we were allergic or not, we were all completely raw as we unloaded this. And we kept unloading and unloading. And two hours later, we looked at the trailer and we were halfway done. 
And by, you know, by the end of that time, each one of us was very, very forlorn. But we thought, $7 an hour. This is going to be amazing. And so we kept working and kept working. And as I talked to Billy this morning, he goes, it's the hardest day of my life of work. I've never worked harder than that. Four hours, almost four hours later, we had all that trailer emptied and it was all stacked in that shed. And then we stood around together and the farmer came out and he reached, he had a billfold, just, just have you ever seen the, the real thick billfold, billfold? And we were excited, we were doing the math in our heads, let's see, four hours, seven dollars an hour, that's, that's more than ten dollars. <laughs> and he walked to each one of us and he handed each one of us seven dollars. And we, we're Bible college students. We, we're trying to have a good testimony, but we received the, the seven dollars. I mean, dead, dead on our feet, completely raw. And we took the seven dollars and we said, "Thank you, sir." And we we drove back to campus. Now, when we got back to campus, we because we were spiritual, we prayed about it, <laughs> and we said, "This is so valuable. This seven dollars is the hardest seven dollars we've ever earned in our life." We put it all together and we put it in the missions offering that week. It doubled the missions offering. Now, what was the problem here? Two different mindsets. We were thinking $7 an hour. He was thinking $7 a job. Big difference. Now, think about it for a moment. That's what we're dealing with when we talk about grace. In our mindset, in our own mindsets, we think of grace, and we're not really certain. What, what does this mean? Maybe you've heard that, that acronym, grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is his gift to us. It's what he gives to us. And, and when we come into our lives and we live our life with the old merit mindset, we get into a lot of trouble. You see, the, let me give you a little bit of context about this parable itself. If you go back to chapter 19, the rich, a rich young ruler came to Christ, and this is what he said. He said he, he had everything. He had the, the uh, Rolex watch. He had a Hugo Boss robe. He had Gucci sandals. He was driving a Ferrari at the time. That might, might be not exactly, but you understand, he had arrived. But he knew in his heart there was something missing. And so he came to Christ, and he said, this is what he said, what good thing must I do to have eternal life? Merit mindset. I've done all these things, and Christ tested him. He said, well, keep all the commandments. See, I've kept all the commandments. I'm perfect in that way. And then Christ said this, go and sell all you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. What was Christ saying? He was illustrating to the rich young ruler that his whole trust and all that he was about was about what he had achieved and the power and the wealth that he had. He said, look, lay that all aside and come follow me and trust in my grace for you. It's one of the saddest stories. He walked away because his wealth, he had tremendous wealth. That rich young ruler was operating under the merit, merit mindset. Later in that same chapter, verse 19, verse 20, uh, verse 20, chapter 19, verse 27, Peter says this. He looked at the rich young ruler, and this is what he said. We have left everything to follow you, Lord. What then will there be for us? Same mindset. Look what we've sacrificed for you, Lord. Are, we, are you going to come through for us? Are we going to get some amazing things? The merit mindset infected all, all the people that were around Christ at that time. You see, when we're governed by a merit mindset, it's antithetical to God's kingdom. That's crucial that you understand that as we lay the foundation in this. When we talk about merit, we're talking about earning, gaining, achieving, deserving. Those are the key words that are involved. The economy of grace, God's economy of grace, is not compatible with a merit mindset, with works. When we look at things from man's perspective, we miss God's perspective, his grace perspective. And what Christ was saying through this parable is, if you understand grace, you will thrive. If you miss grace, if you do not understand my grace, you will be frustrated through your entire spiritual walk because everything runs on that. This merit mindset fit well in Christ's day and age with this, the spiritual leaders of the time. Because you see, for them, what they said was, if you want to please God, keep the law. Keep all of the law Keep all of the rules and keep all of the rituals and you are good to go. Merit completely. 
You work hard and you will earn God's favor. But what Christ was saying prior to the parable and after the parable, in, verse, in chapter 19, verse 30, the, what he says is, but many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. And then again in verse 16, the last will be first and the first will be last. Christ was bracketing this parable by saying, what it appears to you to be is not what it is at all. In God's, in God's kingdom, it's totally different. Now, let me give you just a couple details about this parable. When we, when in verse 1, when it talks about workers, those are day laborers. They are men that, that uh, are in a, in a central place, and the farmers or the, the people that are working come down, and they choose the laborers for the day. They are dependent on being chosen to be able to feed their families. A denarius that's mentioned in, ver, in verse 2 is a typical day's wage. It's what, what you would earn in a day. And when it mentions the marketplace, that's kind of like the union hall. It's where everybody gathers, and they're hopeful that they will be chosen. Then he goes through a series of hours. In early in the morning, which would be about 6 a.m., sun up, he goes and he hires a group of men. The third hour is 9 a.m. The, the sixth hour is 12 noon. The ninth hour is 3 p.m., and the eleventh hour is 5 p.m., the day ends at 6 p.m. when the sun is beginning to go down. That's a typical work day in, in Christ's time. And so only the people that were hired in that first hour agreed upon a wage. He said, I'll pay you a denarius. All the rest of them agreed to work, and they were not told what they were going to be paid. In fact, he said, I will do right. I will do right by you. Verse 8 is significant because the last ones that were hired were paid first. It's kind of like when we were standing around waiting for that farmer to pay us. In this case, they, the ones that were hired last, just one hour of work, were paid first in front of all those who had worked hard all day long. And they were paid a denarius, a day's wage for one hour, hour's work. You see in verse 10, the expectation of those that, were hired, that had been hired earlier on. They expected that they would be paid a, a great deal more. Verse 11, they grumbled. We deserve more. We've worked harder. There it is again. Christ is drawing attention. We deserve, we merit more than these that have only worked an hour. hour. The parable is a contrast between that merit idea and God's grace. In God's grace, he does not treat us as we deserve. Aren't you glad for that? If I were to receive from God what I deserve, I don't know that I'd be standing before you this morning. God's grace is so radically different from anything that we understand. God's grace is, is an economy that is foreign to our economy. It's radically different. You've heard me say in the past, we are not in God's kingdom. We are not achievers. We are receivers. Everything that we are and all that we do, we receive from him. Now, if you're looking at your outline, we're finally on Roman numeral one. What, I'm going to define grace for us a little bit. If, if you were to answer somebody what, when they ask you, what is grace? This is maybe a, a helpful definition. Grace is the provision of God freely offered to us to enable us to accomplish his will. Grace is the provision of God freely offered to us to enable us to accomplish his, his will. Now think about that for a moment. It's not given to us, it's offered to us. Why is that important? God's grace is offered, but it's not automatic. God's grace is offered to each one of us, but we must accept it. We must receive it. When we talk about salvation, what, is, what does the scripture say? For by grace you are saved, through faith. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast or, or woman should boast. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. It is a gift, but it must be received. His grace must be received. What does that also mean? His grace can be rejected. It can be rejected in, in salvation. It can be rejected in sanctification as you move through your life. It can be rejected in the midst of trials. His grace is offered to us, but we must accept it. We must receive it. Grace is motivated, the second fill in the blank, letter B. Grace is motivated by need, not by merit. It's motivated by our need, not by merit. You see... The kingdom of God gives us that which, we, which, which it demands. Otherwise, we could not attain it. Listen, I'm going to say that again. 
The kingdom of God gives to us that which it demands of us, otherwise we could not attain it. What does that mean? When God asks us to do things, often they are way above what we could do. And so his grace is offered. And he says, if you will receive my grace, I'm offering it to you, you will be able to do things that you never experienced before. I, I won't do this, but if I were to stand out in the lobby today and I were to have keys to Rolls Royces and they were all parked out here, I know some of you would say, it's not a Subaru, I don't want it. I know that. But I'd have these keys for a Rolls Royce and I'd hand you those keys and you'd go, th thank you. You'd be overwhelmed at first and then, and then all of a sudden the reality would set in and you'd say, you know what, I can't even afford to change the oil in this car. It, it probably costs $600 just to change the oil. A and when I go to put tires on this thing, what, is it, what are the tires costing? I, I can't afford it. But with the keys, I hand you a credit card and I say, any expense that you have for this car, you simply put it on this credit card, it's all covered. That's what God does for us. Let that sink in for a moment. I'm, off, I'm offering you redemption. I've completely paid the cost of your sin through my son, Jesus Christ. And as you live this life that I'm calling you to, I'm going to ask you to do things, and you're going to say, oh, no, 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 my grace is sufficient. If you will simply receive the grace that I have for you, think differently, no more earning or deserving, simply receiving, then... You will be able to accomplish things, and the only one that could ever get the credit for what you accomplish is myself. All the glory goes to God. That's the grace economy. The, the point of this parable was this. The workers were equal in their need, and that's crucial. The, the guys that were hired at the 11th hour had a family to feed and, and clothing to put on their children and their families, as well as the ones who were hired first. And what the, the landowner was doing was he was saying, I'm going to meet your need. Each family will have what they need for today. I'm going to pay you the same. Before God, all of us have the same need. We all need to be redeemed. We all need his grace day by day. And his grace is sufficient for each day of our lives. It's sufficient for everything that we need. You see, grace is motivated by our need. The landowner ministered to the last ones hired in compassion just as much as he did the first ones that were hired. It was not about what they had done. It was about the need that they had. That's the point that Christ was making. Merit and grace are mutually exclusive. Grace never operates on the basis of merit. You see, grace is called unmerited favor. It's unmerited favor. It's based upon our need. Before God, our, the need is the, our need is the same. We need grace, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now think about it for a moment. Some of you are here this morning, and some are joining online, and you never understood the grace of God. The grace of God says you are lost. You are separated from me because of sin in your life. But here's the good news. Here's the gospel. I pay that price. I'm offering this gift of salvation. I'm going to forgive you completely of all the sins you've ever committed. And my grace will continue to forgive you as you move forward from this point on. It's a gift, but it must be received. It's offered. It's not automatic. If you're here this morning and you've never understood God's grace in this sense, it's saving grace, this is the day. Today's the day to open up and to receive that gift of God's grace and receive him as savior of your life, as well as lord of your life, to move forward. Now here's the catch. The grace economy is hard for some of us because God gets to define our need. Do you hear what I said? God gets to define our need. You've heard me mention this before, but the father and the son were in the mall and they were looking at a sneaker store, sneakers, uh, Todd, sneakers. Sneaker store, you must have heard, but anyway, they were looking and the, and the boy said, Dad, Dad, I need $120. I want to buy those sneakers. He said, that's not your real need. Your real need is $81. That's the difference between what I'm willing to pay for your sneakers and what you want to pay for your sneakers. Dad reserved the right to define the true need. And so often in my own life, I come before the Lord and I say, I need, I need. And he goes, that's not what you need. You think that's what you need, but I know you inside and out. I created you in your mother's womb. I know what you truly need, and my grace is sufficient for your true need. 
that turns all the control over to him. That the rich young ruler, when he was faced with giving up all that he had, he was giving up his security. He was giving up and he was trusting that God would do the right thing for him and meet his need. And he couldn't do it. He wouldn't, wasn't able to do it. When, when the landowner hired the others other than the first hour, he said, trust me, I will do what is right by you. You must trust me. So you see, in the economy of grace, we must trust God's goodness. We have to truly trust that he will do for us what we need. Sometimes we come, Lord, if only I had this, then I would be happy. No, you wouldn't. That's not what you truly need. Lord, if only you could free me from this, then I would be all right. No, that's not what your true need is. I know what your true need is. So this is the key, humility. I come to the place in my life where I say, I'm not God, you are. I bend the knee. I bow before you. I receive what you have for me. I receive your grace in my life. And if you choose not to meet what I thought was my need, I'm okay with that. You're God. I'm not. And in humility, I bow before you. I bend the knee before you. God knows exactly what our needs are, and he offers us his grace, his provision, <coughs> provision to meet each one. James says it this way. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. When I come humbly before him, his grace is poured out in my life. The economy of grace is foreign to us. We are programmed from little on up with a merit mentality. In, now, I could get in trouble here, but in Sunday school, when we memorized our verses, we got a gold star. When we were, had perfect attendance, we got a little, little pin with a little, do you remember? And I had, I had like perfect attendance. I, I used to lean over like this from the little things that I got. I loved, I loved earning and, and, and getting and receiving. And it's built in us. We earn our grades, don't we? We earn a wage. We deserve a break today. I won't go on with the rest of that commercial, but anyway. <clears throat> That's programmed in each one of us. That's the rich young ruler. What good thing must I do to earn eternal life, to get eternal life? Peter, we left this all. What are we going to get now? Haven't we earned a great deal? The scribes and Pharisees of Christ's day said, had such incredible problems with Christ because he was taking their system and throwing it away and saying, that is not God. That's not what God does in our lives. And they killed, they crucified him. Because they had gone, he had gone against what they so carefully had, had allowed. Now think about it for a moment. And you've, again, you've heard me say this. If you talk to somebody on the street and you say, ask the question, if you were, God forbid, if you were to die tonight and stand before the God, and he said, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? 95% of the people that reply, if they reply at all, will say this, I'm not so bad. I've never embezzled funds. I've never murdered anybody. I've never work, 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 what I've earned, what I deserve. It's not grace. Grace says, because you loved me so much, you sent your son for me, I received your gift of grace. And that's the only reason that I can be let, allowed into your kingdom. Not what I have done, what he has done. What he has done in my life. This is what grace is all about. You see, a, a merit mindset gives you security. What is required? Give me your requirements, Lord, and I'll check them off, and I'll be sure. That's what the young, rich, young ruler said. I've kept these commandments since I was a young boy. Everything's good with me. I'm good to go. Why do I still feel empty? Because you've never understood my grace. Give all that you have to the poor. Come follow me. Humbly accept my lordship in your life as well as my sa being savior of your life. That security is a false security because it's based completely on what we have done. And the final thing is this, it's scary. It is scary for us to trust the goodness and generosity of God. I, do, you, do you follow me on that? To abandon myself to God and to say, your will, not mine. In this circumstance, in this situation, I am not demanding anything. I, I don't deserve anything but your mercy. I trust your mercy. I trust your grace in this situation. You do for me what you want to do, and I will give you all the honor and glory. That's a scary place to be. It's the place of abandonment to his will. Wait and trust. <clears throat> what is most pleasing? Pleasing. In fact, 
what that means is he's in control. Verse 4 says, I, he said to the workers that he hired later, I will pay you whatever is right. And they trusted him. They went to his vineyard and they began to work. There was never an agreed upon wage. Trust is a prerequisite for receive, receiving God's grace. Trust means I know that he is gracious and I trust him to be gracious. I know that he truly, he knows my true needs and I'm going to submit to what he does for me. Unless you, Christ said it this way, unless you change and become like a little child in trusting dependence, you will never enter the kingdom of God. What does a little child do in the morning when he gets up? My breakfast is all ready for me. What, what does he do as he going, I'm going out to play because I, I, every, all my needs are taken care of. What does he do when he comes to the, the lunch table and the dinner table? The food's all ready for him. Everything's done. What does he do at night? Where am I going to sleep? No, his room is all prepared. Unless you change and become like a little child and receive all that I have for you, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Roman numeral three. A merit mindset causes big problems. Now, point number one under this, letter A, is the problem of comparison. And I understand, I do, I understand that none of you do this. None of you ever compare your lives with people around you. I know that. I do, though. So I'm preaching to myself. I, I preach to the choir, but they're not there right now. How often in our lives do we look at somebody else's life and say, man, look what they're enjoying. Look what God has blessed them with. I, 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 I've taught children's church, for goodness sakes. Shouldn't I deserve, I'm sorry, uh, shouldn't I deserve something more than this? The psalmist in Psalm 73 said he looked around and he saw the wicked, not even, not even other Christians, he saw the wicked and they were thriving. They had everything money could buy. And he said, look, I've served you faithfully. I'm almost losing my way. As I compare my life to their life, it's, I, I, I'm, I'm really upset, Lord. Until he went into the tabernacle, into the temple. And in the presence of the Lord, he understood their end. This past weekend, as I, as I talked with classmates that I haven't seen for years, and I saw the, I saw the sadness in their hearts. I thought, these, for us, 45 years of ministry... I, I look at what God has done in and through us, and all I can say is to God be the glory. Amen. Has it been easy? No, no. Has it been glorious? Yes, because he's in control. When we compl we're, we're in com uh, incurable compares, that merit mindset, the <clears throat> those that were hired at 6 a.m. compared their wage to the, to the later workers, <clears throat> and they judged others unworthy of grace. Have you ever done that? Jonah. Jonah looked at Nineveh and said, they are not worthy of your grace, Lord. In fact, they're worthy of your complete, utter judgment. You need to wipe them out. And I'm not going to, to testify that I'm not going to share the gospel with them in Nineveh. You know what happened that, as a result of that. And when he went, and the whole city repented, he was angry. They did not deserve your grace. He didn't understand his own need for grace. When we compare ourselves to others, what we are doing is we're un unable to see God's tremendous grace in our own lives. It robs us of being able to rejoice with God's goodness in other people's lives. It robs us of that joy. Their good fortune, when we see the good fortune of others, <clears throat> often we're jealous of them and sometimes we're even angry with God. That problem of comparison is huge. The second thing is the problem of trials. <clears throat> in this world, and here, here I'm going to say it, we're moving into a time in our country and in our world where persecution is going to become a reality in a way that we never experienced before. When trials come into our lives, what's the first thing? And I say, Lord, what did I do to deserve this? And he's saying, it's not what you deserve. It's what I'm allowing in your life by my grace. By my grace, I'm allowing this to happen. That's why James says, count it all joy when you experience trials. That irritating vo verse, but what is he saying? God knows your true need. And in this situation, a trial, a, a, a challenge is the only thing that will 
allow me to do what I need to do in your life. Will you receive from my hand even the trial? So often we're, we're blinded to the benefit of that trial. We're cut off from God's grace because we become angry with God at the prolonged trial that he's called us to go through. And, and that bitterness or that anger cuts the grace off that he has for us to sustain us through that trial. The problem of payback. This is Peter's problem. In, in 1927, look what we've done for you, Lord. What are we going to get? It's payback time. Again, I know none of us do that. But when we went to Spain, you've heard me mention this, we gave up uh, and left a ministry in New York. That was incredible. I, it was just a, a, a thriving ministry, <clears throat> and we knew God was calling us to Spain. And uh, this was not Sheena. I'm, I'm taking her out of the picture here. This was me. As I went to Spain, I said, Lord, look what I gave up. Look what we did. We sold everything we had. We moved over to a foreign culture. At 30 years old, I've got to learn a new, we've got to learn a new language. I've got to start preaching in a new language. So within about two weeks, I'd like to be able to speak in Spanish pretty fluently. And then, Lord, would it be too much to ask to be the Billy Graham of Spain? I, I'm just thinking. I, and that would be neat. I, I'm, I'm just offering it out there. And Lord, you know, since we're over here and we're away from our family, could everything just really go smoothly? I, I, I don't want there to be any major problems and, and difficulties. Lord, look what I gave up for you. He had another idea. He had another idea. And this is what he said. Stop. Receive from my hand whatever I have for you. Because my grace is sufficient for you. And as we put aside the merit and we adopted or adapted to the grace, what we saw was, yes, struggles. The language did not come easily for us. It was tough. It was hard. We went through, I, I got food poisoning, lost 25 pounds within two weeks. We went through a lot of things, but in that, his grace, his presence was always there. We knew that he was sustaining us through this time, and, and we saw lives transformed in, the, in our ministry in Spain. People, I don't know where you are this morning. I, I don't know if you've op been operating on a merit mentality. It's deadly. It's deadly in our spiritual walks to not understand that everything that we are, all that we do, is a matter of God's grace to us. It keeps us from being victorious. It keeps us from being able to experience the, the power of his spirit working in and through us. But as we humble ourselves and acknowledge our need day by day, sometimes moment by moment, we acknowledge our need, his grace pours into our lives and he allows us to overcome. He allows us to do what we would never be able to do by ourselves to his honor and glory. If you're here this morning, I'm going to say it again. And you never understood that his grace offers you forgiveness of all of your sins. Today is the day of salvation, scripture says. Today is the day to receive, he offers, receive his gift of salvation. But if you're here today and you're a child of God, but you've been operating even unconsciously under that merit mentality, comparing yourself, being jealous of others, or, or saying, why would, have you allowed this in my life? Repent and allow God's spirit to awaken you to the wonder and the power of his grace. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace. To say that I fully understand it, I can't say that. Because as I was raised as a child, I always understood that I work for what I get. That the things that come into my life as a result of, of meriting them and Father, in your kingdom, that is so foreign and so destructive. So Father, this, this week, may as we walk through this week, may we see your hand of grace at every corner. May we see your spirit al aligning our, our spirits with the grace that you have for us in each situation. And may we lean into your grace. Father, for some of us, that will mean that we receive you as Lord and Savior of our life. For others of us, it will mean that the trial or the difficulty or the test that we're going to go through, we will have to humble ourselves and receive your sustaining grace. And for yet others, 
it will mean that as we acknowledge our need, you will transform us in a way we could never be transformed otherwise. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name.
we uplift that to you right now. You will always be holy forever, Lord. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the exalted one who sits high upon the throne, guiding and leading our lives as we go through our days and our weeks till we meet you, Father God. Lord, I just pray that we can bask in your grace this week, that not only can we receive your grace upon us, but we can show your grace to others and those that we come in contact with, Father God. I praise you, Lord, for what you're doing in the hearts and minds of the people here and the blessings that you are pouring out. I pray that we have a wonderful rest of our week and that you go before us in everything we do. In your heavenly name we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful week, everybody.